Nowadays, big blockbuster movies can cost up to $30 million to make, but it was a very different story back in the 1950s. This is the Lido at Ryslip near London. It's hard to imagine now, but key scenes were made here for arguably the biggest British film of the 1950s. It was a night to remember. Night to Remember remains the finest and most accurate film account of the Titanic disaster. And I'm here in London to talk to the film's producer, William McQuitty, who has personal recollections of the great ship herself. My first contact with the Titanic was in 1911, when I saw a team of 20 draft horses struggling to pull one of the great anchors through the cobbled streets of Belfast from the foundry down to the shipyards Halden Wolf. And in the shipyard, this huge mountain of a ship was rising, and I watched her rise every day. And I said to my father, how on earth can they get this huge ship into the sea? And he said, they lay the keel on the slipway and then they build the ship on the keel. And when the day for the launching comes, they grease the slipway with tons of tallow and train oil and soap. And they give the ship a gentle push and the ship slides down to the water. The whole of Ulster was excited. This was the biggest ship in the world. And they're all excited about the launch. And everybody in the country turned up, and all the ships in the harbor. And there's a great crowd at the launching platforms. And three stands were erected round. And I remember the enormous noise. Maroons went off, rockets went off, and uh, signals were given to stand clear. And just as my father said, the chocks were knocked away and the hydraulic rams gave the gentle push and I didn't believe it was going to move and it didn't move for quite a long time. And then I felt suddenly that I was moving backwards, but of course it was the ship was moving forward and it went faster and faster and it was pulling, they had great tons and tons of anchor chain that were attached to the ship so that when it, to stop it gathering too much speed and these chains made an enormous row, and they were dragged on, and the ship went into the sea with a tremendous splash, and all the sirens and everybody, and it was great rejoicing. And I felt very proud of this, and proud also that my birthday was the 15th of May, 1905, and this ship's launch was also in May, the 31st of May. So I had a great kinship for that ship. The other kinship I had for it was that I wanted to leave Belfast. I wanted to see the world. I'd been reading the boy's own paper and the Wide World magazine, and the one thing I wanted to do was to see the world. And I thought if this huge ship can escape as easily as this, then a little creature like me might manage to slip through and get out into the wide open world. That is what I wanted to do. We lived at Bangor, which is 12 miles from the shipyard. And there we watched the Titanic on her trials. And she went up and down the lock, and she was so big, she made the lock look small. It was almost like 
a toy ship on a toy sea. And I thought again, this Belfast law connects this ship with every sea in the world, with every country in the world, and if I can get out, boy, I'm going to see them too. And then on the 2nd of April, 1912, we watched her go out for her first voyage. The disaster affected everybody in the world, but the people in Ulster were much more affected because we all had either a friend or a relative or somebody connected with it. In 1924, I escaped from Belfast. I joined the Standard Chartered Bank, the same bank as John Major, our Prime Minister joined, and it took me around the world. And finally, I was in Shanghai, and my mother was dying of terminal cancer, and I came home to be with her. And she died, and I, the war started, and I joined the Ministry of Information, and I made documentary films. But all the time, I was thinking about the Titanic and what a wonderful film this would make. The opportunity occurred when my wife, Betty, brought back Miranda, our youngest child, from Queen Charlotte's Hospital, together with a review of Walter Lord's book, A Night to Remember. Now, no film can be better than its script. And here was a ready-made drama. He'd researched it for 20 years. It had everything I needed. And I took the book to the rank organization with whom I'd made a, a great many films. And the head man was John Davis. And he said, Bill, this film is just another shipwreck. It's been made before. It's small screen black and white. You have no stars in it. It's impossible to make this film, and it's going to be very costly. And I said, John, this is not just another shipwreck. This is an end of an era. And he said, what do you mean? And I said, the steerage passengers paid 12 pounds. The stateroom passengers paid 875 pounds. This is for a five-day trip. When the ship went down, there were no lifeboats for the steerage passengers. But the first class passengers put on evening dress to go down as gentlemen. And the order, women and children first, was I think interpreted inaccurately by Lightholler, who thought it was only women and children, because there's room in the boats for another 700 people. The other thing was that in the memorial to the dead in the Titanic in 1912 lies alongside the war memorial in Belfast City Hall. And in the Titanic memorial, the names are an order of importance. But in the war memorial, they're in alphabetical order. It was an end of an era of arrogance and uh, it's, a, it's a very important piece of filming. This is New York City and I'm here to interview Walter Lord, the author of the original book, A Night to Remember. I wish I knew how my interest in the Titanic began. I really have <clears throat> no idea. I just have always been interested in it. I think it's, uh, I, when I was nine years old, I was interested in the Titanic. Uh, I think perhaps it has something to do with 
the way little boys catch cold. They, nobody knows how they do it, they just do. I think the same thing with my interest in the Titanic. I had finished a book on our Civil War, and uh, I was looking for another project. I thought perhaps about the Civil War again. And my editor, who was a chap I'd worked with in OSS in London, said, uh, again, you were always talking about the Titanic. Why don't you write a book about it? So I began doing it, but I'd done most of the research just to satisfy my own curiosity. When I went to Princeton, other people went to the library to study the classics or French or something, that I went to the library to look at the old newspapers on the Titanic. I also found the hearings there, the American hearings, and that's a, such a wonderful, uh, unexplored treasury of material on the ship that I gobbled that up too while I was at it. And then I was pretty much ready to write about the, the, the subject whenever it, whenever it happened. I was ready without knowing it. I uh, worked out my outline of my book, chapter by chapter. I then wrote a draft, and then uh, the time my editor felt was that that was the time to get in touch with the survivors, when I knew as much as I was ever going to know without them. And so I then I began a sort of blitzkrieg of getting in touch with survivors. And they, 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 it was difficult in a way because there was no survivors association at the time. There was no Titanic club. There was no Titanic uh, interest, really. It had no, but nothing had been written on it for 40 years, not since 1913. And so uh, uh, it was a challenge just to find them. And I didn't have much money. I worked in the advertising business at the time as a writer. Uh, so uh, I, my solution was to write letters to the editor and place, ask editors of various newspapers to place these letters in their letters column. And I tried to pick the cities where there might be most survivors from what I knew. For instance, Chicago was a place where a lot of them were going who were going to settle in the Middle West of our country. New York was an obvious place. Some of the most prominent came from Philadelphia, so that was another place. Then there were the Belfast papers. Of course, she was built in Belfast. And then there were the London papers, the British papers. And then, of course, the Southampton Echo and those coastal tip papers. All, I sent barrels of these letters out, each of them, of them uh, informal and personal, not just a form, form mimeograph letter. I sent them a personal letter to the editor and asked them whether they would run it. And an amazing number did. Uh, and then the survivors, uh, the letters said to get in touch with me at my New York address, and then they began writing in. And then, of course, once you got a few of them, they would lead to others. And in the end, I had over 60, 64, I think. But that was the way it was done. And uh, it, on a very low budget of just a number of postage stamps, I managed to get in a very rich harvest of Titanic survivors. It just came to me. I could even show you the spot in the city of New York where I, inspiration said to me, this book should be called A Night to Remember. It was at the corner of 38th Street and Park Avenue, if you don't want to go there. There were certain people in the publishing business, however, who thought that if you, all you've got to write about is the Titanic. How can you not put the Titanic on the cover? This, this, uh, but the, the, the night to remember that was published here doesn't, it has a picture of the ship on the cover. It doesn't explain who she is. It's just running right at the iceberg. In Britain, they weren't as brave. Uh, Longman's Green, who did a beautiful job of promote, publishing it and promoting it, nevertheless on the jacket, they call it a night to remember, and there's no subtitle or anything, but there is a life ring which says Titanic on the life ring, which is going down into the sea. So they, they got around my prohibition that way. Well, the book was a success beyond my wildest dreams. Uh, I was still working full-time in the advertising business. I had a job in the day from 9 to 5, and it was a funny uh, concatenation of, of events there because I would be working... Or rather, low, nothing is lower than a writer in the advertising business. Uh, the, the, the representatives and the executives and so on are all people who deal with the client, but never the writer. He just sits poor, ink-stained wretch and works on his ads. Uh, so I would be working that sort of nine-to-five existence in a very fine company, but nevertheless working in a mundane, humble way. And then at five, because the book had caught on so much, I'd go to the television studio. It was sort of a double life. It was like sort of a Walter Mitty existence for a while. Finally, I went on to other things, but nevertheless, it was, uh, it was a very interesting life to be on a bit of our big television shows one minute, the next minute sitting, sort of sweeping out the corner of the closets in the advertising agency. 
here we are again. It's in its 55th paperback printing. They, and then they're printing their editions all over the world for a while. I collected them all, and I have a dozen or more, and they're fun to ha fun to keep. And I proudly put them up on the shelf of my bookcase. But uh, it, it interests me that so many people in so many places have become interested in this subject. The uh, the editions are in every language you could possibly think of. Not long ago, I, somebody sent me nine copies of the Pakistani edition. Well, that, what did, I, I wish I had nine Pakistani friends, but uh, they just sit on the shelf as it is. I'm frequently asked what the producer's job is in a film. It's frequently confused with the director. The producer's job is to find the best story, to get the best scriptwriter, to get the best director, to get the best cameraman, and to get the best art director. And in all these things, I was very successful. Eric Ambler wrote the script. Roy Baker, a splendid director, directed the film. Jeffrey Unsworth was the cameraman, first class. And Alexandra Vodzinski, known as Vetch, was certainly the best construction and art director in the business. And I was lucky to get them all. They were all uh, overtaken, I think, by the brilliance of Walter's book and by the script with Eric Amber. These were two top people. I mean, you, you can't do better than the script. I heard about it first from my editor, Howard Cady, who said, uh, we've gotten an offer of film for a film deal, and it's from a British producer, and he seems pretty respectable. <laughs> and I, I said, well, I'd love, of course I'd like that. And, uh, I, and I also said, I'd like to work on it, if I could get it into that. And uh, so Howard got the word to Bill McQuitty, Bill McQuitty got the word back, sure, come on over. I was so lucky, Bill was really interested in the Titanic. He had seen it blanched when he was a five or six year old at Ulster and vaguely remembered it. And uh, so he was, it, it was a, he, had, he really adopted the project as his own and was all, there all the time. The thing that interested me the most was how earnest he was in getting it absolutely accurate as far as he could. The sets of the, of the various public rooms are based and modeled after the, what, what details could be found of the actual rooms on the Titanic. The, the clothes, and the, 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 even the casting of the characters was, he just put a great deal of, of, of effort into it. Uh, particularly having the ship look the way the ship did. He used about five different areas for the ship. He had a model and he had a real ocean liner that was being dismantled in northern England. And he had uh, sets that were built. And, he, and he, was, he just was very thorough about it. One of the things I had to do was to build the center section of the ship. That included four lifeboats and two funnels. And Vetch did this. It took 4,000 tons of steel to build this on a great concrete apron, which is still a monument to a night remembered Pinewood Studios. This deck angle of the ship was slightly angled so that by altering the camera, we could get a level deck or double the degree of uh, angle. And each page of the script, I had the angle put in because we don't shoot in chronological order. And one of my problems was lowering the lifeboats into the water. And this I had arranged with the Shaw Savile line. But the Shaw Savile line at the 11th hour pulled out of the idea. I think sinking ships was bad for business. No other shipping line would handle it. I took a plane and went up to the Clyde, and at the yards of W.D. Ward, they were breaking up the Asturias, which is on the Australian run and painted white. The port side had been demolished, but the starboard side was okay, and it was floating and it had the same davits. I got the lifeboats from the Franconia, which was Churchill's secret headquarters at Yalta at the conference. 
and this went extremely well. I told Ward I was afraid they would try to stop me and I'd like a contract and I said how much will you charge me for 10 nights on the starboard side and not interfering with any of your work and I think he was quite enthusiastic about the film he charged me a hundred pounds and I got his receipt and the next day the P&O told him that nothing would have to do with McQuitty and it was too late. It was painted white, but we got the students of Glasgow University to paint it in the White Star colours. Both sides of the ship were shown with the aid of mirrors, and by using mirror writer for the name Titanic where it was visible. In the background, several battleships, including King George V, wait their turn for breaking. Here we see Roy Baker with cameraman Jeffrey Unsworth discussing the filming, which included all the long jumps from the deck into the water. Now these people were professionals and they charged a pound a foot and this was 80 quid a go. And they were wearing these cork life jackets. Now the cork life jacket went down to your, not nearly your knees and if they jumped in those it would have hit up and knocked their heads off. So I managed to stop the first one and got Kapok life jackets built in the same way. And in these they jumped quite safely. The next sequence was shot at Rieslip Reservoir near Pinewood Studios where the rest of the picture was filmed. Well, I was very lucky. I shot this film between November, December, January, February, and we got some very cold weather because it was essential to show the breath of the people in the air. I couldn't have shot it in summer and, and shown their breath, so nature was on my side. The passengers, once they got dunked, and wet. Uh, when we wanted to reshoot, we put them through a hot room, which was very hot, and they were glad to get back into the cold water. I couldn't afford time or money, really, to have several uh, period costumes for each passenger. The hot room did the trick. Kenny Moore had a wet suit. He didn't have to leave the set. He had a white sweater. Underneath this was a frogman suit, so he was warm. Actors are very sensible about things like that. They work it out. It could be done on a lake to have the people swimming around in the water in the shots just after the ship went down. And it could be done accurately in a lake because the Atlantic was so smooth. It was like a lake that night. In fact, it's one of the reasons that the, that the accident happened was because there was no wind at all nothing to kick up a little surf on the base of an iceberg. So that uh, the actual facts played right into the dramatist's hands by having a sea that was as calm as a, as a lake in England. The lifeboats were identical with those of the Titanic and I was fortunate to have the services of Captain Grattage, who was captain of the Queen Mary and the Queen Elizabeth and who had joined the Cunard Line in 1914. Joseph Boxall, fourth officer of the Titanic, was also my technical advisor throughout the picture. On well, filming, they were extremely lucky in the weather because it was cold when the Titanic went down at night and it was cold when they were filming the, the show from based on the book. Little things like the breath that steams out from you when it's very cold were came across so well. You couldn't watch that film without thinking that it was bitterly cold. The water was lake-like, which I have mentioned to you. It was, again, just the way it was. The ocean was, as, was like a mill pond, and they practically had you did, filmed it in a mill pond, as it were. 
in the film, they, there is a moment when a collapsible boat floats off from the sinking Titanic, floats off upside down. And this, in fact, actually happened that night, and you can see it in the film. The survivors in the water, or people who were thrown, thrown into the water, tried to get to this collapsible and did. Uh, but finally, when they had about 25 or 30 aboard on the bottom of this boat, when more people came and tried to get on, there was some very sad scenes where they were kept from getting on. And it was understandable because one more person on board, that boat would have upset them all. But this comes off, I think, very effectively in the film, and it proves, if nothing else, something that I wondered whether 25 or 30 people could really get on the bottom of an upside-down boat without doing, doing damage to upsetting them all. It, did, it proved that you could get that, that many people on the boat because that's what they did. And so it was a scene that gained its authenticity from the film rather than had to try for authenticity. It, it, it contributed authenticity to the to this picture to have, have this film that on the boat that was upside down. Edith Russell and Lawrence Beasley, whom we see here, also were most helpful advice on various shots, as were the other survivors. We see the cameraman Geoffrey Unsworth and the lifeboat containing the unsinkable Molly Brown. These sequences of invaluable behind-the-scenes footage remain in the same chronological order as William McQuitty himself filmed them. We're witnessing five months of intensive production work in the order it happened, and we'll frequently switch between interior studio scenes, as here, to various exterior locations, and, later, to the special effects department. It gives an insight into the many and varied aspects of large-scale feature film production at this time. Kenneth Moore talks to Mrs. Lightholler, wife of Second Officer Lightholler. Joseph Boxall, my technical advisor, seen here once more on the deck of the Titanic. Boxall was walking on her deck when she struck the iceberg, but the impact was so slight that it did not even alter his stride. A lot of heavy concrete foundations are being laid. They have to support the 4,000 ton steel structure which will form the body of the ship and eventually will have to carry the weight of the lifeboats and 500 technicians and passengers. Here the painter, Alan Maley, reproduces from a photograph the painting by Norman Wilkinson, which hung over the mantelpiece in the first-class smoking room. It was prophetically called the entrance to the New World and represented New York Harbor. That painting is interesting to me because I now have it in, uh, in my possession. It was given to me by the J. Arthur Rank Company when they were finished with it. The painting was meant to have been the painting that was on the Titanic smoking room of Norman Wilkinson painting called Approach to the New World. The research that I had done indicated that was the painting that was on the Titanic smoking room. As a matter of fact, I, this was erroneous research and I lost the chance to have a picture really like the one on the Titanic. Uh, to have had that, it would have had to have been a pa pa painting of Plymouth Harbor as it was the painting on the smoking room of the Titanic was the painting that actually was on the Olympic. The plasterer's shop where all the moldings for the pictures were made. 
we see some of the wreck in the stairway scene now. Billy Parton makes up Michael Goodliffe, who plays the part of Andrews, the designer of the Titanic, who went down with the ship, standing in front of this picture. So, so one thing that's interesting, some things happened that he didn't expect to happen, it wasn't looking for them. Well, the sets uh, of, the, of the lounge and the decks were, were on, on cranks, so he could push them up and make, them, make the ship look in a different condition at different times. And as, the, as they jacked the sets up at one end of it, the smoking room set began creaking. And he thought, well, this is a great sound. So it was totally inadvertent, but it looks like a, a one final detail that all the care in the world had been put into just to have the ship really even creak the way it did. It was creaking, the set was creaking, <laughs> it was what was happening, but it worked. And it was a very good, good touch. The hydraulic rams, there were several of them under each, the floor of each set. There was an artificial floor built. And these, set, these sets were very, very big and they had a very powerful rams, and they would tilt the entire floor, and when they started tilting, it made this extraordinary noise, which is exactly right uh, for the sinking of the ship when it, it tortured itself through different angles. So I didn't have to manufacture that noise. Kenneth Moore being made up as second officer light hauler. Kenneth Moore being the star of the film and being light toller, the second officer of the Titanic, who had a very busy night, he had a light toller doing some things that other officers did uh, just to get fatten up the part a little. And I could understand that as part of the theater. The boiler room scene with genuine fires, which eventually set fire to the stage. Fortunately, we were able to put them out. Checking on the raising and lowering of lifeboats before using them for passengers. The iceberg strikes, and beside cutting the long gash in the ship's side below water line, some of the berg breaks off and falls on the deck. The flooding of the engine room, where the great gash opens, we had huge water containers which were released and flooded down. Actually, the shot was only for a few seconds, so a great deal of water came down. It was amusing because the fires had actually set, uh, were rail fires, and they'd actually set fire to the base. And so it was uh, lucky we had the water and, and uh, dragged the hot coals out of the boilers. Outside, it is bitterly cold, and hot soup is served to the technicians. A curious thing occurred on the film. Uh, thanks to Walter's book and the brilliant interpretation and scripting of Eric Ambler, 
all of the cast seem to become part of reality. And it happens also, when I was um, showing the film on the QE2, when the titles came up, you know, the ship's rolling. And the ship, believe it or not, was rolling at exactly the same time. And it was quite eerie. And we see Edith Russell, the survivor who played tunes on a musical pig, which entertained the children in her life. She was a, a fashion stylist, she called herself. She was on board with a separate cabin full of dresses and so on. The one thing she had that was of virtually no value, but which she cherished, was a little music box pig, which was a, a lucky symbol. She had been in an automobile accident, had survived, and her father gave her this, told her it was a lucky talisman to take it with her wherever she went. So she did. She had it on board the Titanic. When she took to the boats, she, at first, just went up by herself with more dressed warmly. She suddenly remembered she did not have the pig. So she sent her steward, who was somehow hovering around, back to her stateroom to get the pig, which he did, and he wrapped the pig up in a blanket just as a way of carrying both. And uh, Edith Russell still hesitated to leave the Titanic. She was standing on the edge of the boat deck. The boat was down, lowered flush with the deck. And uh, Edith, no, a sailor rather, noticing Edith uh, without uh, being unable to make up her mind, took the blanket and the pig from her and tossed that in the lifeboat and said, there's your baby, follow it. He apparently thought it was a child that she had, not this toy pig. The pig is a music box and it's played for years, a song of the times called the Maxis. She, uh, it, it doesn't play, it didn't play anymore, but she left it to me in her will. And I've never dared get it fixed. I just want it to look the way it was when she last had it. And this is the pig, and I still have it. Roy Baker talks with Edith Russell and Lawrence Naismith. Lawrence Naismith really does resemble Captain Smith, whom he portrays in the film. In fact, when Captain Smith's daughter, Mrs. Russell Cook, came to the set, she was quite overcome by his similarity to her father. Water gushes into the dining room. The Titanic took two hours and 40 minutes to sink, and during the film, great care had to be taken to see that the angle of the ship remained in perfect continuity, gradually becoming steeper throughout the picture. Outside, the ship begins its slow sinking by the bars. Mrs. Brown pushes her way through the throng. Here we're intercutting between scenes on the huge exterior angled set and scenes filmed in the studio's water tank. The collapsible lifeboat is launched. People start jumping over the side. Their fall is broken by piles of cardboard cartons arranged above the concrete base on which the ship is built. The huge fuddle crashes and kills the young lovers. Special effects put finishing touches on the Titanic model. For continuity, the use of the port side of the real ship, the Asturias, linked with the use of only one side of the large exterior angled set, and here with the use of the Titanic model, which also was only filmed from the port side. You see, you're running very high-speed cameras at this stage, and you're only wanting a few feet, so that the fellow who's pulling uh, the cord has to pull it quite quickly. I mean, what you're seeing in the model shots is warts and all. I mean, the men have to go into the water to straighten the lines out. It's a very complicated thing. But at the end of the day, you're only using 
uh, what is uh, uh, correct. And uh, if they didn't get it, they'd keep on going till they got it. And this is where the producer is tearing his hair because, uh, you know, one, one could, if you're looking for perfection, you know, you can overshoot enormously. Everything is accurate to scale, and miniature passengers and crew row away from the ship in electrically operated lifeboats. Well, the problem with using water uh, goes back to early apothecaries, because a drop, you got your medicines in drops, because a drop maintains its size. And therefore, if you had a very small model, a drop of water would be the size of a football. So the bigger your model, the more realistic it is. And then we speed up the camera to slow down the motion. And I think this is very effectively done in the model shots. We had different sizes for different situations. But the model you see sinking is about, I suppose, 35 feet long, something like that. In one case, you see the man actually cleaning the companionway, the deck, when the water's coming in. A model that size would have been very, very big indeed. And the bow model would have been big. The model was over twice as long as the water tank was deep, so it had been constructed in sections. As the model sank, parts were successively removed from the front end, already below the surface, to enable it to sink lower and lower. In the third class, passengers locked in struggled to get out. Outside, the producers checks the preparations for the final scenes. The ship is cleared of snow from a recent fall. Shooting continues on the model. A separate model, showing the bows only, was used for these dramatic shots. The camera was attached to the model and followed it into the water, as can be seen here. Outside, the lifeboats are full and the remaining passengers scrambled towards the rearing stern. I was learning film business all the time. The problem there was that uh, an audience in a film picture, in a picture house, moving to picture house, cannot keep in mind all the characters that might be uh, in a story. There were 2,200 people on the Titanic going down that night, and uh, it's just impossible to, to remember them all. At the same time, it, there's no index you can look up, and when you're sitting in a, in a movie theater, you have to go the pace of the film. So composite characters were really necessary so to keep in mind uh, the, all the people, the types of people anyhow, and that seemed to me to be a perfectly valid thing to do, as long as the things that they did were, were things that were actually done. So uh, I was happy to, to go along with that. Down below, the water continues to rise in the engine room. This scene was shot in Cricklewood Pumping Station, London, which had similar engines to the Titanic.
Still in order of shooting, we come to the last location, which is really the opening of the picture, where Sir Richard and his lady set out from their stately home past the waving orphans. It is the final shot. On the lot, the grandeur, which was once the Titanic, goes up in smoke as the unusable sets and fittings are burnt to make way for the next picture. But the great concrete base remains a humble memorial to a great disaster. A Night Remember had its premiere in Leicester Square Theatre. It was a wide success. It got the finest reviews that any film ever got. It was the best film and the most expensive that the rank organization had ever made. And I was sent off to America uh, to open it there. The problem that rank faced in America was that the film had no stars. The American audience was used to having big names, and they followed the names. Uh, they had heard of the Titanic, but they didn't see how, uh, and it Clifton Webb in one of the Titanic things, they didn't see how this picture is going to work without a star, or several stars. They had no documentary films at all. And if you like, the, and I remember, was a gigantic documentary factual film in which the ship was a star. And this was almost my intention. So he said, fine, Bill, you go out and fix it with the Yanks. So I went out. I spent a month there. I went on radio. I made personal appearances. I, whatever I could go, I pointed out. We got rave reviews in America. We got the Golden Globe Award, the top award. Uh, and we got other awards, and Christopher Award, and, and several others. And there's no doubt about it that the people who understand films uh, accepted it as being a terrific film. But the, the mob didn't come in because the girls, who, who are they going to see? However, I plowed on, and I did my stuff, and for 30 days I went round, and gradually it took off. But it was quite interesting to me to see that the reviews of the film didn't really help it. It didn't help either that we had a newspaper strike for three days. But eventually these reviews surfaced, and everybody, they all agreed it was a terrific film. Uh, the survivors, uh were brought to New York by the J. Arthur Rank Company for the premiere of the film, which was here on Times Square, one of the big movie theaters. But I had a chance to meet them and, and to talk with them that day, and they, they seemed to me it just it was a gold mine come true to have all the, so many of the survivors right here. Incidentally, while I found maybe 64 survivors, I think the J. Arthur Rank Company found, Bill McQuitty found another 70. And uh, so the survivors list kept growing and growing and growing. And then after the film came out, still more survivors popped up. I think we must have been in touch with just about everybody by the time uh, the film was made. One of the people who were with me throughout the picture was Captain Grattage, captain of both Queens and captain of the Lancastrian, which went down off Cap Saint-Lazare with 3,500 men on board, all drowned. Why is that not regarded? Because these men were in a fighting area. In other disasters, the ship has not been uh, properly taken care of. It's gone down. There are, there are hundreds of these disasters. But the thing where the Titanic differs from all these ones, she was the biggest ship in the world. She was brand new. She was never called unsinkable by Harald and Wolves, but unsinkable was the pattern that followed her. And the arrogance of the people on board, 
the arrogance of the difference between 875 pounds and 12 pounds for a five-day voyage. They weren't paying this extra money because they got all that difference in accommodation of food. They were paying it because they were arrogant. They traveled first class. And today, many of these ships have got one class. I mean, the people in the steerage were people and should have been accepted as such. And this is coming now. Now, this was the beginning. This was the end of the era of this idea that by paying money or dressing up in fancy clothes, you could be superior to someone else. I think it stands up very, very well, uh, particularly the end of the ship. I don't see how they managed to do it so effectively when they were just working with the studios and props. And uh, when the bow goes, the ship goes down under the sea. It, it just must have been the way it was. It all came right, and the film is still running. It comes out on television, and uh, it still has not aged. People inform me it hasn't aged. There's no way it can age, because it is simply the truth. And the people are properly dressed, and uh, it is a piece of history. But it is a film that I think has enormous audience participation. And when in America they were complaining that people were not going because there were no stars, the moment anyone went, they, they, were, they were convinced. And I think they came out of the cinema changed people. I don't, none of the, there were 85 survivors alive when I made the film, and I corresponded or saw 50 of them. And all of these people had this extraordinary calm attitude to life. They were, I wouldn't say resigned, but they were happy to accept life as it was and not asking for miracles. I was very affected by this because this, of course, is what I got from the original sinking. I got an attitude to life that um, you, you have to make the most of what you yet may spend before you too into the earth descend. It's very important. And the last thing you want to do is to be put down saying that uh, you did so want to be nice to Susie and <laughs> it's too late. And too late saddest words in any language. The 14th of April, 1912. A night to remember. A night when the largest, most luxurious liner of her day was speeding across the North Atlantic on her maiden voyage. No expense had been spared to make this ship a symbol of man's final victory over nature. Her first class passengers were the very cream of society. The aristocrats from Europe and millionaires homeward bound to America. In the steerage class, everyone enjoyed their own kind of boisterous fun. Then there were the second class passengers and the crew. 2,208 happy, confident people speeding across a flat, calm sea in a ship that everyone knew was unsinkable absolutely unsinkable. The ship was called the Titanic. What did you see? Iceberg, get ahead, sir! Kenneth Moore, whose warm, compelling sincerity holds him high in the hearts of cinema goers all over the world as Lightoller, the second officer on a ship whose destruction shook the very foundation of man's progress and marked the end of an era. How many people are there on board? 2,200 or more. And room in the boats for... How many? 1,200. 
This is the epic drama of the greatest disaster in the history of the sea. Goodbye, my dear son. Here, for the first time, is the story of that night. A night when 2,200 men, women and children were faced with a terrible fact. The fact that most of them were going to die. No work of fiction could ever contain such incredible twists of fate or leave such terrible questions unanswered to haunt the mind. Why did that last ice warning never reach the captain? What happened on the ship that stopped within sight of this struggle with death, but didn't save a single life? No writer of thrillers could ever achieve such agonizing suspense. Sir, sir, what the devil's going? Haven't you learned to knock before you come in here? It's a distress call, sir, from the Titanic. She's sinking. Carpathia, sir. She's making 17 knots and should be with us about 3.30. That'll be too late. The film is still going strong, like the book, it's a classic, and it doesn't, it doesn't show signs of aging because there's it, nothing to age about it, it is as it happened.